Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and uh, we have uh, some holidays coming up. Well, happy Hanukkah to all of you that celebrate. Merry Christmas. Uh, that's going to be happening before we're on next time. I think it's Sunday if I got that day right, but I hope everyone uh, that celebrates either one of those, uh, I hope it's a, it's a great one. And uh, I'll have a show before next year, of course, before the new year. And Kurt Jamungle is my next guest tonight. Tonight, I, I invited John Ramirez back, and uh, I had to switch dates. It was going to be on the 27th, because last time he was on the show, I had uh, internet, really bad internet problems where I could not even hear what he was saying. It was frozen on my end. Luckily, uh, the way this system works that I use, uh, the when someone else is on the internet, like a, a guest, um, it works off of their internet, so he, we were able to do the show. But it was it was quite comical. I couldn't understand what he was saying. I didn't know what direction to go in because of that. But anyway, I had right away people were posting on the last video. You should get him back, you know, right away. And uh, so he's here. To, he's joining us tonight. Uh, we'll probably do an hour show, maybe a little bit longer. And uh, you are welcome to post questions in the chat. And to do that, uh, just put it in caps so I see it. And uh, uh, some people will write me and say, hey, you never asked my question. I, I like for a question to kind of fit where the conversation is going and where it is. And sometimes I scroll back and uh, we'll ask a question later. I can do that. And uh, we don't have any capability to take calls, uh, but there is going to be a new phone system put in at KGRA Radio. And uh, eventually we will have. Uh, that ability again to take calls during the show. So this week's blog is a UFO crash in Aurora, Texas. And uh, that had to do with uh, the, uh, well, it could have, it could have been a hoax. And that actually has a, a question mark on it. Uh, you know, but that one is a very interesting case. But a, a lot of that might have just been generated for from a newspaper article that was basically to get, you know, tourists in the area. So we don't really know 100% sure. There, there was some people that did uh, some shows on that, trying to discover metal fragments and things like that. And uh, there was, at that time, back in the 1890s, there were these small dirigibles that were powered with a gasoline motor, and they did blow up. So that's a possibility. But According to the witnesses, it was a lot of aluminum, and that wouldn't really, I don't believe they were made out of aluminum. I may be uh, totally wrong in that, but I thought they were probably made out of some type of canvas and wood, the way they did uh, dirigibles back then. But anyway, I'm really glad to have our guest on, and uh, I do want to thank everyone that supports the show. Very thankful for that, and anyone can do that over at podcastufo.com. There's a little uh, support the show. And again, I do appreciate all that. And I do appreciate um, everyone that listens to the show. And, uh, you know, once a year, I should uh, reflect back and just be grateful, which I have been uh, for all the people that do pay attention to the show. And, uh, you know, I was told that it's possible that some people pay attention to the show that we may not want them to kind of in a joking way, uh, you know, whether it's uh, it's not really uh every show, but some shows that are interesting. And this would be a good example tonight because I have a ex CIA agent. So who knows who's uh, checking that out, but I'm sure uh, that's a very big possibility. Uh, anyway, I'm bringing them on now. John, welcome back. Well, uh, thanks for having me back. Uh, hopefully this will go smoothly tonight. Yeah, I feel it. I feel it has. I know you had an appointment showing up there right at the time we're starting the show. So I appreciate you uh, hiding in your bunker or wherever it is you are to uh to do this show i appreciate that a lot so uh i don't know exactly where we left off i thought we'd just have another conversation uh you know and because uh it, it you have so much to say you know that's the number one thing people put in the chat in the last show was hey you know he this guy has a lot to say and your show was too short so uh but uh i think it's it's fascinating and for uh I don't think we touched on it last time, but I do remember you saying the first time that we talked over a year ago that there were a lot of people in the CIA that you found out also had an interest in the UFO topic. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, first of all, you know, the UFO uh, issue um, has never left CIA from the very beginning. Uh, various offices had that what we call accounts. Uh, they're basically uh, areas of analytical study called accounts. And they had the UFO account through these successive offices up until this very day. Uh, it started with the Office of uh, Scientific Intelligence. And it was a scientific uh, intelligence branch that had it. And then that came to be its own office of scientific intelligence. And there were various divisions within the scientific intelligence uh, office that had the UFO account. And that became the Office of uh, Scientific and Weapons Research, later became Weapons Intelligence, Nonproliferation and, and Arms Control. And to this very day, I will tell you that the UFOs account, the UAP account, is being studied in the uh, successor to um, WINPAC, what we call WINPAC, and that office is the Weapons and Counterproliferation Mission Center. It is primarily focused uh, in the, the airborne parts of that mission center, those who uh, analyze uh, air defense systems, air warfare systems, as, as well as naval systems. And I think that's very significant because of the fact that these craft are transmedium uh, going mm. into and out of the water. So people who analyze um, as their day jobs, perhaps uh, adversarial submarines will also take uh, the transmedium UAP into account as well. So it's still there. And um, so I'm sure, you know, that when... People think that, uh, you know, Project Blue Book, Blue Book ended in 1969 and all of a sudden all that started um, funded in 2007, started off in 2008. You know, that that's it. No, that, it's been continuously studied throughout uh, the, the history uh, of ufology um, to this very day. Did you ever hear about the transmedian medium type? of craft prior when you were actually at in the cia uh, before 2009 had that topic ever come up in any type of way uh not transmedium to to the extent um of knowing that these craft go in and out of the water but i'll tell you one thing um, i was not read into one particular compartment that the department of defense held through the navy and i was read into all manner of compartments, inclu including Q, uh, which is nuclear, and including crypto, which is codes and ciphers. And those are two very, very sensitive areas of intelligence. But this one particular program was held by the Navy. It was a special program in the Navy. And for some reason, the program manager when I was up to be read into it, called up and said that uh, I was not eligible to be read in, uh, that the department felt uncomfortable reading me in. And I uh, related that, hey, I think I know that submarines are used to collect intelligence. Uh, mm. that, that sh that's a well-known fact. You know, yeah. I mean, we did it during World War II and throughout all the uh, uh, subsequent wars, I mean, submarines are intelligence collectors. I know about that. I know there are sensors underneath the water to collect adversarial uh, activities, uh, submarine transits, for example. And he said, no, no, no. This, this is the most compartmented area of the Navy since the Manhattan Project. Nothing is more sensitive. And wow. you're not eligible. And I go, gee, why is that? I got Q. I got uh, Q clearance uh, and I got crypto clearance. Those are the most two sensitive yeah. ones I know. And I also was cleared for various special programs uh, that CIA had, special technical operations programs. Why not this? And the only thing I could think of was that throughout my career, when I was up for reinvestigation and, you know, the first one occurs after three years and subsequent to that, every five years, you're up for a reinvestigation and a complete new polygraph. And during the invest, uh, reinvestigation, I've had various investigators ask me questions about my hobbies. And I've always said, you know, like one of my hobbies is, well, I like to study UFOs and ETs and uh, I go to UFO conferences 
and a big fan of uh, listening to Coast to Coast AM. <laughs> they dutifully wrote that <laughs> in my security profile um, and it never caused any problems. I, I go to UFO conferences and I had to tell CIA, it's a, a branch of um, the Office of Security, it's called External Activities. And through external activities, I'll let them know, hey, I'm going to a UFO conference on my own dime. I'm taking annual leave using my own personal time. I'm paying for my own tickets and I'm paying for my own hotel room and conference fees. You know, it's all just me as a private citizen. And yep. they never discouraged me from going. They said, fine, go. And they only asked me, are you going to reveal that you're a CIA officer? And I said, no, I'm not going to like stand up on stage and do anything like that. You know, I mean, if it comes up in casual conversation, I might. Uh, but I'm, no, I'm not going to advertise that. And so they had no problems or no issues with it. Um, and so that was always in my profile. And so the only thing I can think of is that whatever this Navy program might have been, it had something to do perhaps with trans medium vehicles, the knowledge that these UAPs may travel underwater uh, egress out of water into sky, into the space, and ingress back into the water. Maybe there's some compartment about that. And I've only heard uh, inklings of something like that, that the uh, Office of Naval Research and this Navy part of uh, my old office, OSWR and WINPAC, had some kind of relationship and that certain materials may have been recovered and then transferred over to a defense contract. Yeah, that way they wouldn't have so, any congressional oversight, right? Well, no, there is congressional oversight because any time taxpayer money is spent on any program in the executive branch of government, the legislative branch has oversight. I see. The only thing where there's no oversight is if it's proprietary technology. That is, that company is developing some capability on its own dime. They're using their own research and development money to do yeah. something. So they will like research, develop, and engineer some product on their own dime with absolutely no government funding, no taxpayer money. Uh, that's proprietary, and then uh, Congress does not have oversight over that. Uh, but if one penny of taxpayers' money is used in that program, there is oversight. Uh, so, uh, so that's a myth uh, that you can hide programs like that. You can if it's totally over there. Now, yeah. Yeah, so there's an exception to that, um, is that if it's a government program and everything is supplied to a contractor as, as what we call GFE, or government, government Furnished Equipment, GFE, and we wash our hands of it and say, here it is. Oh, by the way, we need, a, we need you to buy it. And I've actually have been in transactions where we sold a contractor this expensive piece of equipment for $1, a bill huh. of sale. We have to have a bill of sale. To make yep. it legal so we transfer it for one dollar it's theirs and they yep. can resell it they can develop it further they can do anything with it but they're not getting any further taxpayer money to do so wow i didn't realize it, it was exactly like that now i had at one point back in 2016 i believe it was i had christopher mellon on he, he did his first actual interview about the ufo topic um when i had him on and i I asked him the question, if a president of the United States wanted to know, you know, what the government knows about the UFO topic, I said, can, can he get all that information? He said, absolutely. They have to tell them. But he also said that it could be, you know, like a need to know and compartmentalize in, in a way. Um, where the person that he asks, I don't know how deep of a dive they can do, but um, I guess there are some like safety as there is some safety as far as that goes, as far as revealing everything. And he also said that um, when it goes into the private, the private sector, then it's protected. But uh, I believe he didn't, he didn't em embellish um, the fact that if it had any taxpayer money at all involved, then that does not work which is uh which is news i'm i'm glad you you said that yeah uh, yes and in, in fact um, um there are layers of compartment compartments many layers of compartments and uh the the uh, the perhaps the uh 
the least compartment and area is, uh, we don't call it need to know, it's just the fact of. The fact that some program exists and the fact that this program deals with some issue. Uh, the, uh, any president will absolutely know that. He'll be briefed on that. But he is eligible to know more, but uh, perhaps they do know more, but at some level, they know the fact of everything. But that doesn't mean that you get information on the programmatic details. That doesn't mean that you know uh, who's doing the work, how much it's costing, and what the progress is. You know, mm. they may not even know that. They may not even want to know that. There's so much on a president's plate. But the yeah. fact of uh, a president would know. Uh, so I would agree with Chris Mellon that at some level, a president is eligible to know, but they, at least they know the fact that something is occurring. And I know for firsthand that I was very briefly uh, the control access program uh, officer, um, I would say, no, a uh, compartment access program control officer at CAPCO for a technical operation that CIA has had for decades. And uh, at this time, it was kind of winding down. And they say, here, John, you, you, here, here's everything. Here's everything about the program. And I got picked up the file from the Cognizant office in the Directorate of Operations. Uh, so, and I can't say where or what area division of that uh, directorate was responsible for this program, but I got everything and I was part of that program. And I saw my name there, it was my name, social security number, birth date, and the, the, and the date I was read in to that program. It was all there. And sure enough, there were like every president uh, since that program's existence was also on that list. It's called a bigot list. Hmm. And so they knew at some level that this special technical operations program, which was extremely sensitive, uh, was occurring. But they may not have known like exactly how we got everything staged for this program, uh, what we collected or, you know, like um, other details of the program. Um, he, the president may, may not even want it to know. He just knows that there's a technical operations program conducted by, by the executive branch, which he is, he is the chief executive of um, on behalf of the U.S. government. And so he knew like this, this operation was occurring and, mm -hmm. and successive presidents have signed off on it. It's called a finding, you know, it's, it's a finding. Uh, I authorize this program. Uh, so that's what happens. Wow. Interesting. Now, uh, speaking of the presidents, a number of them, past presidents have been on the Jimmy Kimmel show and uh, he, the first thing he asked them, like, hey, what do you know about, you know, aliens and UFOs and, and all that? And uh, I know my friend Ben Hansen did a, a really great video. It's on YouTube and the body language, using the body language that Obama had. And he, he was saying you could see his, his, uh, his uh, uh, he took several like shallow breaths and he could tell all this body language that he was, you know, it seemed as though he might have been holding back, which he probably was. Um, and with that, do presidents get told that they, you know, hey, this is, I, I mean, I imagine they're told like they can't really share things. I mean, when it's top secret, that type of thing. I mean, I don't know how that works, but I would think that, you know, uh, uh, if a president knows all these top secret things, he really shouldn't be in the public's eye uh, talking about what he knows, especially when it comes to national security. But I don't know about UFOs. Well, I I would say, yes, um, like like uh, a president uh, would not haphazardly reveal classified information especially something that sensitive, even to the point that uh, President Trump uh, did not want to reveal what he knew about uh, about the UFO topic. And, but he did say that he was told interesting things about it, but yeah. he would not reveal anything about it. Um, and, and in fact, I believe it was um, Obama himself that with uh, Jimmy Kimmel, he said that they do not want us to talk about this. And people assume that they meant uh, the Defense Department. 
And I always interpret that as they meaning um, our visitor friends, that they control dis uh, they control disclosure. No government in the world controls disclosure. If if these craft want to land anywhere and and step out of them, they can do so at their own will. We can't stop them from showing themselves. Uh, and so that's an important point that they say, well, the government's holding back. The government's holding back. Well, it could be that they want us to hold back, if, assuming that we've had some kind of relationship with them um, hmm. that may have uh, started decades ago, that they do not want to be revealed by any government and no government has up to this point. That's assuming that there has been official contact and some agreement in place. And that's a long stretch because I can't find any uh, solid evidence for that. Uh, but, you know, you hear things, you hear things. Hmm. Um, and uh, I like to use the Robert De Niro quote, you know, I, I hear things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he always says, I hear things, I hear things, and I've, I've heard things. Uh, but I, I, I can't say that, you know, this is, this is fact because I've not seen anything personally about yeah. that. Yeah. Here's a question that uh, kind of falls along this. Is there any one agency that knows everything about UFOs and how many people would be involved in that agency, if so? No, uh, no one agency knows everything about UFOs because if you look at the intelligence community, they're divided into functional missions. And so depending on the responsibility of that agency, they would know about what they are responsible to collect against anything whether it be UFOs or an adversary. Uh, so, for example, if there are any kind of electromagnetic emanations coming from these craft that were collected, uh, obviously that's the National Security Agency because they are the SIGINT mission manager. Uh, if there are photographs or videos, uh, that would be the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency because they're responsible for overhead imagery. The analysis and collection of it, the NRO primarily builds satellites so if any of their satellites collected anything, uh, they may or may not know what was collected, but they definitely know that, you know, they may have been involved in some kind of activity where uh, they wanted to know if, is this a glitch or is this, you know, satellite working? So they have to know something about why they're looking at this particular uh, constellation of satellites to determine whether it was functioning. Oh, because we found these orbs flying over Russian space, and we want to know if there's a glitch in your hardware and your satellite or your ground software. Uh, they would know that. Uh, Mazent uh, is part of um, DIA, and Mazent is the collection of anything that isn't signals or imagery. It could be like radiological, it could be um, uh, chemical, it could be biological, some emanation, some signature other than what's coming out of a radar or communication systems or uh, that's something that's not an, an optical image. So DIA mm -hmm. would be responsible for that. And, and it was the Mazin folks that went to Skinwalker Ranch, that part of DIA, um, mm -hmm. which is the Director of Science and Technology, DT, DIA DT. They're responsible for Mazin. Uh, so it depends. And uh, CIA, uh, we're a human organization. Human intelligence and in uh, the 1947-1990 write-up by uh, CIA's historian at the time, uh, he said that you know UFOs were studied by the Office of Scientific Intelligence, and the Life Sciences Division was interested in UFOs. Life Sciences being like biologists and physiologists and medical doctors and you know people dealing with like biology, biological sciences. They were responsible for looking at UFOs. I mean, does that give you a clue, you know, that there are no aeronautical engineers or aerospace engineers in that division? But having said that, there are other parts of the Office of Scientific Investigate, uh, Intelligence that were responsible for these types of uh, things like uh, like aircraft and so forth. They were res responsible for looking at UFOs as well. But that was a long time ago when the intelligence community consisted of basically the CIA and the Office of Naval Intelligence. And at that time, the Pentagon was setting up its uh, its own intelligence services. Air Force intelligence, Army intelligence was all, you know, being ramped up again. Uh, so, mm. 
you know, no one agency knows. Uh, but I always said that for as far as collection, where since the UAPs are very visual in their presentation, it's lights in the sky, their orbs, um, their plasma, there's something that will trigger uh, collection from an electro optical system. And then NGA would have all of the videos and all of the photography, uh, at least from space. So, mm -hmm. If anything, as far as visuals, if you want to see them, NGA has the evidence that you can see. Hmm. So, you know, when you watch these science fiction movies about we're going to be invaded uh, by, you know, like I think maybe a fleet of craft or whatever it is, they always say, you know, that these are deep in space and it's heading this way, that type of thing. And, and uh, you know, it's in the science fiction I'm saying in those in the realm of that and like it stopped or whatever. And like, so it can't, it can't be a natural object. Uh, uh, how much truth is to that as far as how far out in space are you aware that we have like sensitive equipment that would be able to detect something actually heading toward our planet? Well, we have the uh, James Webb Space Telescope at 1.5 million miles from the Earth. Yeah. Uh, but our geosynchronous satellites, um, by definition, they're like like 23 to 24,000. I don't know the exact figure, uh, but they're, that's geospatial intelligence looking back down at the Earth. Yeah. And um, we also have uh, satellites in low Earth orbit and in medium orbit and in what we call the high elliptical orbits. But they're looking back down at Earth. And so they would detect something coming from space into the uh, over the Earth's uh, atmosphere and into the atmosphere so they can see that. Uh, but otherwise, what you have are like astronomical instruments, astronomical probes, satellites, hmm. not satellites, but actual probes that are out there, uh, you know, like scanning the sky. These other telescopes that may have uh, like James, uh, in addition to James Webb, you have Hubble. But you have, you know, various uh, other scientific packages orbiting the moon, orbiting Mars and whatnot. Um, and so as far as deep, deep space, you have radio observatories, radio telescopes listening for signals. Mm -hmm. And you also have the James Webb Space Telescope and Hubble and other astronomical platforms like that. But as far as the intelligence com community is concerned, it's very much looking back down at the Earth because that's where our adversaries live. Right. Uh, but, you know, I, I always say, you know, I, people like the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Um, I, I'm not so strongly in favor of the extraterrestrial hypothesis that they came from 39 light years away, which is where Zeta Reticuli is, and they're like zooming in and coming here immediately. Uh, I always favored the idea, the notion that they've been here longer than we have. And so we're the visitors and that they don't look like us. We look like them because they made us. They adapted us to live on this planet. Um, so it gets very complicated. Uh, but it melds a lot of various models. Uh, for example, the extra tempestrial model by uh, Dr. Michael uh, Masters. Uh, yep. He has a very interesting model. I am, in fact, yeah. I highly recommend his book. If I can plug his book. Yes. I'm reading this book. Um, and That's really good. I find that to be very fascinating. Um, and also, like, there's an interdimensional aspect to this, and there's also uh, like a intra or ultra terrestrial that they're here. Uh, they they reside on the planet. They may have bases that we can't see on the moon, on Mars. They're like really close to us, and they've always been here and interacted with humans. And humans early on thought them to be gods, uh, messengers of the Lord, angels of angels of God. You know, that's how mentally um, they were able to fathom what the phenomenon that they saw chariots a fire in the sky you know things like that wheels within wheels landing as uh, ezekiel uh, has written about in in his book and so i think they're been interacting with us for a long time it's just now they're very much heightened uh there's very much heightened interaction because of the fact that in 1945 in july of 1945 we exploded a nuclear weapon right and yeah. that got their attention that you know the kids have found the box of matches and they're lighting them 
That's and kind of what Stan Freeman used to say. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I, I didn't realize that. Yeah. 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 But um, Lou Elizondo sort of hinted kind of at what you're saying, that what if he said, what if everything we think we know is is wrong? And what if there's been a presence here all along or something like that? He said that on on someone else's podcast. And the next time he came onto my show, I tried to get him to elaborate it on it. And it, he didn't it didn't really know any more than when he yeah. started. But yeah. he sort of it was kind of very similar to what you said. Uh, which I heard on another show, him talking yeah. about. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I would say this much. Lou is very well informed. He is not a whistleblower. People think of him as a whistleblower. He is not a whistleblower. He's doing something very official. He has an official function in all of this. And um, he is uh, very much championing the, the, uh, Moving, expanding the sandbox, moving that mm -hmm. envelope out, you know, forward, expanding mm -hmm. the sandbox and seeing what he can say. Um, he doesn't say anything that he's not authorized to say. He is right. He's going to pay attention to his NDAs like I have to. I still have NDAs that I signed. Um, uh, even though I got read out of them, I signed that I would protect them. As long as I live, I have to protect those 26 compartments I was read into during my 25 year career. So I can't say anything about those capabilities that I learned about. Um, and, he, and so he knows things that, and I believe he expanded as much as he could to plant yes. that seed. And I believe other speakers have done so as well, uh, who were uh, former government officials, that they're like trying to test the waters to see what the public reaction might be to introduce this particular idea in the public framework. And it's not disinformation, it's just information. Uh, yeah. How how are you taking it? You know, what what is your uh what wh how are you reacting to it? And shall we go forward or do we just plant the seed and let it germinate? I know I asked him like and I think everybody asked him the same question. Do you know things that if you could reveal them, you know, would change people's thinking on the UFO topic. And he basically says, uh, yes, or he hints at yes. He doesn't quite say it. <laughs> now, I'll say, I, I would say, yes, I, I know at least one thing. That one thing that I absolutely yeah. cannot talk about. Absolutely yeah. cannot talk about. Yeah. Well, oh, that's, that's interesting. I think people were also writing in the chat at the time. Well, why don't you just, you know, for the for the for you huma humanity, why don't you just say it? And uh, you know, he, his saying on that is he's not going to go to jail for anyone to lose whatever uh, he has now. You know, just because of he's not going to reveal anything he's not supposed to. Right. Yeah. I, at the um, Mesa, Arizona um, UFO Congress, uh, a woman approached me wanted to know about uh, the uh, extraterrestrial NHI presence uh, on the moon and Mars and other places. Uh, and I said, I, I can't say anything about that. Uh, I'm sorry. And so why not? And I said the same thing. I am not going to go to jail for you. And basically she told me to F off. Oh, nice. And I'm, and I'm sorry, but I can't. You know, that's just it. I, I cannot yeah. say that. Wow. Um, and, and, and the truth be told, I really don't know for a fact. I was never read into that. But yeah. uh, if you spend 25 years at CIA and you have an agency full of spies uh, and they teach you how to be an intelligence officer in CIA, you're going to hear things. Yeah. And you may not be read into them formally, but you're going to pick up on a lot of things. And I've picked up on many things. But this one thing is uh, something I actually absolutely saw with my own two eyes. And I know the background of it. I know the history of it. And I can't reveal that. Yeah. Yep. I'll give you 10 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's a question here. Uh, John, are you saying that you believe that ETs are forcing the government to cover up the UFO phenomenon? That was uh, what you said, sort of yeah, a little bit toward that earlier. 
I, I, the forcing is not correct because the government at any time can disclose. Yeah. I think there was an agreement in place. What I'm saying is if you believe that uh, you have to make a lot of assumptions, and one of the assumptions is this, that Roswell really happened and there were beings on board and one of them survived and we had contact with that being, telepathically perhaps, and that other beings arrived and paved the way for other beings to arrive and that a former U.S. president, Eisenhower, met with them. And the legend is that uh, it was Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico, you know, near Almogordo, New Mexico, that there was yeah. a, some meeting and some agreements were made that were uh, continuing onward. Uh, if you believe that, you have to buy that first. Yeah. Now, uh, if such an agreement was in place, uh, the secrecy would be like we will exchange to you, U.S. government, technology that we have in exchange for you keeping us, uh, our existence, secret. Hmm. And if you do reveal us, then this agreement is null and void and we're no longer sharing this, this technology. But having said that, if we were able to like develop this technology on our own, that they seeded it and we were then taking it up on our own because we have smart scientists and physicists and uh, so forth and so on here in the U.S. And they were able to develop something um, for government use uh, on their own. Uh, then, you know, that I don't see any problem with, you know, them enforcing that anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And at least divulge the fact that, you know, there are lights in the sky that are real. So all of this disclosure since 1947 is basically a two-step thing. In 1947, the government realized that something was here, right? And something was here and something was flying in our skies. And that in July of 52, many things were flying in our skies over our capital. Right. And at that point, it was decided, okay, we need to like manage this information because they're showing up in plain daylight, you know, and uh, we don't want that to happen. And so we're going to say that we're going to say we know they're real and we're going to continue to study them, but we're going to tell the public that they're not real. And we're going to study them in, in secret. And so you have various various programs uh, that culminated in Project Blue Book to, to, to study them. And I contend that it continued to be studied. OK, so where we at now is basically the government has retracted its original statement that they're not real, that they are real. And the other thing that they uh, are now stating is that we're studying them openly. And that's basically it. But the yeah. part that we are not going to hear is if there's any cooperation or any contact between humans and them, whoever they may be. Yeah. You're not going to hear that. And so full disclosure is everything. It's not only the craft and lights in the sky, which the government says, yeah, there's something up there that's flying that we know it's up there and we're studying them. And we're studying them in public now. We had like one hearing uh, since the UAP task force era. And so that's that's the only admission they have. But they're not going to admit to anything else. And that is what I can't disclose. Hmm. To give you a hint, it's not uh, necessarily our country, but perhaps another country. Very interesting. Uh, so uh, following along that, do you believe they dictate more to world governments than just foreclosure. I mean, disclosure, foreclosure. Ah, how did that get in there? Uh, I don't know what dictate means. I Because, uh, like, if they're dictating to the world governments, they're doing a terrible job yeah. of giving us advice. Uh, I think humans, you know, pretty much rule themselves. But I think um, they're not dictating policy to us. They're not dictating human policy to us that you shall do this or you shall not do this. They're not orchestrating conflicts between nations. We do that on our own. Mm. Uh, what they're doing is trying to prevent us from destroying ourselves and then and them in, in the process. Because as I stated, I believe they they share we share the planet with them, that they arrived longer than we were here, and that we share the planet with them, and they want us not to destroy them, us and them along with us. And so they may then um, uh, nudge uh, certain policies for strategic arms 
to limit strategic arms, to reduce strategic arms, uh, to lessen uh, the uh, possibility of going to a nuclear war, and that they were intervene in that sense. And they have intervened, if you believe uh, in uh, what happened at Maelstrom Air Force Base and other Air Force bases, as well as what happened at uh, the launch sites in the Soviet Union and in Russia, that there's been some intervention to prevent uh, these missiles from either being fired or um, not being prepared for launch. So, right. you know, some intervention at that level, but I don't think they're telling us that, you know, you know, they're not telling the Russians go to war with Ukraine. I mean, things like that. They're not advising that type of like everyday human policies of world governments with each other. Right, right. I have uh, on the 10th of January, Mario Woods, he was on before, but on a pre-recorded show, he's coming on live to talk about uh, what happened in South Dakota, I believe it was, you know, at a, a nuclear uh, missile base. And it's just an amazing story. Um, one that you may be interested in hearing. It's uh, what what they did to like, they actually triggered, these things were triggered, the warheads were triggered. And they even drove like trucks on the, uh, what do they call those doors that blow off in the explosion uh, that cover the missile warheads? Uh, anyway, they would put a truck on that when the thing was activated to try to stop it, to try to make it malfunction if the thing did launch. You know, I mean, there was some pretty scary times, according to him. Um, yeah. And, um, yeah. When you say trigger, you mean a prepared for launch, that they were ready to launch. They were they're in launch mode. OK. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Because, you know, uh, there's a lot to do with actually arming a nuclear warhead. There are a lot of things that need to happen in order to arm a nuclear warhead. Yeah, I believe that. I bet that. So, That's true. Yes. Yeah. So I do believe that. Uh, what happened to Maelstrom is that they prevented the launch. Right. They took out uh, the uh, uh, 10 modules, one belonging to each That's missile. Right. Yes. Um, and uh, the Air Force actually reported on the fact that these modules were offline. All 10 and they're of all and in, the independently. Yeah, they're all independent of each other, which is, makes it even a bigger puzzle. Yeah. Yeah, how it would have been done. Right, right. Yeah. So that prevented a, a go to launch situation. And so uh, it sounds like what happened in South Dakota is it Minnow? Why not? I forget. Yes, it might have been. Yeah, why not? Why not? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised that, you know, that they were getting ready to launch because yeah. Yeah, that would know. have been a disaster. Yeah. Even, yeah. even if the ar nuclear warhead did not arm. If they yeah. went to launch and uh, they went to their pre-programmed, and I think you can actually dial the yield and also uh, dial uh, the target. You yeah. can actually do that uh, on the ground. And if they went to where they're supposed to land, uh, the yeah. Russians would have seen that and they would have they would have launched. They, they would have counter strike. That's and right. That would have been very dangerous. Yeah. But again, that's I heard that's what happened to the Russians, that they were prepared to launch all of a sudden and they couldn't stop that. They were like, what's going on? You know, we're yeah. ready to launch because they had a first strike cap uh, policy that they'll launch first. Ours was a counter strike. If you launch, we'll launch. Yeah. And so we weren't able to react to their launch if they mm. take out our inability to launch. But they have a first strike policy. They were able to launch. And so Maelstrom happened on March 16th. 1967 on march 17 1967 the very next day this big truck rolled uh, rolled in this big trailer rolled in with missile number 1000 in the minuteman series missile uh -huh. number 1000 and and in may they put missile number 1000 into the silo out maelstrom hmm. just months after this incident and in june uh that's when uh president johnson spoke with uh, his counterpart uh, Premier Alexei Kosygin and broached the subject of maybe we should reduce or limit the number of strategic arms. And yeah. Kosygin agreed that we have too many right now. We need to reduce uh, them because we might. There's a possibility of going into an accidental nuclear war. And yeah. so that happened m months after Maelstrom. So message received, in my opinion, message received by our government that we needed to do something, and that led to this strategic arms reduction treaty which is now being renegotiated with the russians 
So yeah. even though that, you know, Russia is in Ukraine, uh, does, does that mean the U.S. government has no diplomatic relations with Russia? We still do things with them mm -hmm. uh, diplomatically. And uh, one of them is the Strategic Arms Reduction Talks, a treaty to expand that, to make it even safer uh, and make it less, more foolproof that we won't go into a nuclear war. Yeah, that would be nice to, to get that covered. I wonder how many times we can blow ourselves up. You know, I've heard, I, I don't know exactly how many warheads there are, but it's over 2,000, I believe, in the world, right? Well, there, uh, there are 450 um, on the Miniman 3s. Hmm. Uh, they took, there used to be one called the Peacekeeper, MX Peacekeeper. Um, and then they uh, retired those. They took the Mark 12 warhead off of it and put it on the Miniman 3. It used to be Miniman hold three warheads and now holds one Mark 21 warhead from the old peacekeeper system. And that's what's there now. They're replacing that uh, later on in the 2020s with something called the Sentinel system. So Sentinel is a new missile to replace the entire Minuteman three hmm. fleet. So, I mean, we're still building missiles, yeah. but uh, we're, we'll be, we're building less missiles and retiring older ones. Yeah. Because we don't need to blow ourselves up that many times. <laughs> exactly. It's crazy. What, once is enough. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully we'll never see that day. Uh, can you, this person wants to know if you can tell what agency collects data on drone tech of other countries. Wouldn't it be the CIA? No. Okay. Absolutely not. Because a drone, a drone is an airborne uh, vehicle. And so they're in the air. So they'll be collected by something in the air. So it'll be collected by... Uh, what's it's known as um, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance platforms. They could be uh, from space or they could be airborne. And they'll they'll see the launch of the drone. They see the trajectory of the drone. And so that could be the Air Force. That could be the Space Force because they're supposed to have space situational awareness of everything that's flying. Uh, and so that's the physical drone itself flying. And it may have a, a signature there that might be infrared or it could be... Um, some other signature that they can detect from satellites. Uh, that's so that's like NGA, Air Force, and Space Force. Okay, mm. so that's one. Now, if there's a signal, the, a controlling signal, a guidance signal talking to that drone, a command guidance signal, that's NSA. So NSA would be responsible for that. And so mm. there were the there would be the government entities, CIA, we're human intelligence. We talk to the spy, so we want to know. Uh, if you if your government has an intention to launch drones, and please let us know before they launch them. That's why we recruit spies in foreign governments. The actual agents are not us. They're people in foreign governments working on behalf of the government, but also working on our behalf for exchange for monetary compensation, goods and services that we pay them to provide us information. And it could be, you know, we, we're we're going to do a massive drone strike. And so there, that's human intelligence that CIA would get. But technical intelligence would be NSA, NGA, uh, and also uh, the Air Force and Space Force. I keep forgetting about Space Force. Is that, um, have you followed up on exactly what, do you know what they're actually doing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Space situation awareness. Um, they're responsible for 50 miles up, 50 miles and up. That's, what, that's how we define space. So... From the runway to 50 miles up, that's Air Force. From 50 miles up onward, outward, um, that's Space Force. And uh, they're there to protect space, the space domain, uh, preserving the use of space for U.S. for US forces. Ah, uh -huh. uh, this is a friend of the show, Tom King, in, uh, in the Phoenix area. So... Are there highways in the sky or swarms of UAPs we should look at that you're, have you ever heard of any of anything suggesting any of that? Highways in the sky, like uh, most traveled routes? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Well, you know, there are flaps in areas and they're very yeah. regional, you know? Right. Uh, I would say that uh, the Southwest is, uh, and he's uh, he's in Phoenix. I'm in, I'm in Tucson. The Southwest is a hotbed uh, for sightings. Um, and also you have the national labs uh, in New Mexico. Um, I, I would say the Southwest definitely. 
is is a is a hotbed. Um, but I I would uh, then the the Costas, you no know, Cheryl Costa, she and um, yeah, and uh, she she did a wonderful work. Uh, she's with uh, I believe it's it's a is it her sister that worked with her? Uh, uh, I think it's her partner. Yeah, her partner. Okay, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry for the uh, for making that mistake. Yeah, uh, the Costas have done a wonderful job. Uh, actually, like kind of tracking by region, by zip code, even of where these sightings occur, and it's it's like not where the sightings occur, but where the sightings didn't occur seem to be like the minority. Like they're mm. everywhere. Yeah. You just yeah. need to look up. You know, just need to look up to use that that phrase from uh, a recent movie. Yeah, uh, right. You know, uh, I mean, I went on a UFO uh, sightings tour with Melinda Leslie up in Sedona. Oh, and for yeah. Mr. King that just said that question, uh, get up there and go, go meet Melinda Leslie, make that arrangement. And uh, uh, with these night vision goggles, third generation military grade uh, goggles, you'll see a lot of satellites. I saw a lot of satellites, but then again, I saw an object that was traveling very fast that stopped, did retrograde motion left and right of its path and kept on going. And well, Satellites yeah. don't do that, folks. <laughs> Satellites wow. do not do that. And there were like things that were flying in a non, uh, uh, they weren't following Kepler's law of orbital motion. I mean, they were like maneuvering. Yeah. And so there weren't airplanes. There weren't anything like that. They, they were, as Melinda will tell you, these are the real UAPs. I saw, I was out with uh, Ben Hansen out in, in Phoenix at night. We did a sky watch out there with all his, all his uh, great uh, visual uh, night vision, um, you know, binoculars and things like that. And I saw a bat. I mean, I at first I thought for sure I was seeing a UFO because of the way it was moving. Uh, and then, you know, it ended up being a bat. So, but there are a lot of things that are seen with those, that type of vision that you would not see with a naked eye, I, I do believe. And I do believe that's why we're seeing more like the Navy is, uh, you know, getting some of those videos because they're um, they're in a different spectrum, I do believe. Uh, I think it's time for us to say good night to KGRA Radio. Thank you, everyone over there. We'll be back uh, next week with Kurt Jamungle. And uh, thanks again over at KGRA Radio. And Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah. So we're going to continue on a little bit here. So uh, Mary Grace has this question. What do you think about the group? the Collins elite and their opinions on aliens and UFOs. I'm not familiar with them. Are you? Um, the Collins elite allegedly are uh, folks in the Pentagon who would like to uh, suppress the notion that these visitors are all space brothers and sisters with our best interests at heart. Oh, and so the way they do that is try to um, try to cast them as satanic, as demons. Uh, they try to cater to those who, uh, through their own religious beliefs and their own religious belief systems, uh, will be more amenable to thinking that way. And so they want to scare people in thinking that, uh, they're here uh, to invade us, to take take us over, and we need to defeat them in some way. Hmm. And to they're not all space brothers and sisters. Um, that's the Collins elite. Uh, now, some people think, well, that's just a conspiracy theory. No, there are people in the Pentagon who believe that. And huh. so they do not want to entertain anything to do with uh, looking at UAPs, even from a scientific kind of uh, standpoint, because they do believe that they are they are demonic. Mm. Um, it's just that they're just projecting their own belief systems. Not that I'm not castigating anyone's belief system, but they they closely hold these belief systems, and that what they're seeing they believe is fulfillment of biblical at least from the Christian standpoint, prophecy. Um, that they're, they're, uh, they're devils, they're demons. They're here to deceive you and to, um, 
and to uh, make you disbelieve in what you believe. And hmm. so that, that's a real group. As far as um, what I know about them, um, I have not run into anyone who I would say they're members of the Collins elite. That is, I don't know if it's an organization or it's a label for that belief that they're demonic. Um, mm. So I don't know if they like get together and as the Collins elite, but I do know that there are people who deeply hold uh, religious convictions, more of a traditional Christian nature that will perceive UAPs and their occupants as demonic. Yes. Uh, I know that, uh, again, I know I mentioned Lou Elizondo earlier, but he was saying that a superior um, that he reported to actually thought they were demonic, mm -hmm. which I thought was very interesting, you know, with that position in the government, could actually think something like that. So that's that's uh, another interesting uh, take on that. Uh, this is, I think, is a really good question. If And this is an opinion question. If there was a mass landing of UFOs all over the world, who would handle the media? Yeah, because what uh, each each country or, you know, I mean, that type of thing. Well, in this country, uh, it's going to be a free for all because yeah. uh, we still have uh, an independent media not controlled by the government, influenced by the government, not, not controlled by the government. Uh, in other countries, the media is controlled by the government. But when you have a mass landing like that, which I am hoping will happen, actually, uh, by uh, 2027, I hope that happens because that would break it wide open, of course. That, that'll be the end of that. Uh, there'd be no more need for disclosure because they disclose themselves. That's what yeah. I was talking about, that they themselves are in charge of disclosure. If they do it by this mass landing uh, anywhere, the media is in this country, uh, it'll be the biggest news on the yeah. planet. Uh, but going back to the previous question, there'll be those who believe that the occupants are devils and they need to be destroyed. Yeah. You know, and, and you have that faction and you have other faction believing that it's all oh don't believe that you know it's all like computer generated graphics you know yeah they believe it's cgi you know uh you're going to get a, a a wide range of opinions but uh the, I, I would love to see that happen uh in this country uh it will be the biggest news story ever yes of course and in, and in other countries that have uh more or less an independent press yeah. I think like, you, you know, you again, talking science fiction, they're always like attacking whatever lands here. And that is a very big possibility that um, there would be some type of violence. And, you know, perhaps that's one of the reasons that these things are not really showing themselves, you know, is because we tend to be very violent and tribal. And who knows what we would do if, if there was like a mass landing uh, would we just simply prepare for a conflict or would we actually initiate something? You know, that's, that's right. a scary thing. Well, I, I think I think the dialogue we're having now in this country, uh, even with the recent legislation uh, that passed uh, through the uh, legislature and, and is on its way up to the president's desk, um, even with that, uh, we're, we're kind of preparing the, the U.S. population at least and uh, by extension, the world population and to that reality that there is something, there is a presence here and that we need to explain this presence because if they show up and we continue to do what we did before in previous decades and they show up, there will be mass panic. But if you understand that though these are real and we have five years from 2022 or maybe now four years, uh, if they come in 2027 uh, to, to, for, for the U.S. government to prepare the people about what is up there. And in many ways, I think uh, the word got out uh, within the government that they're showing up in 2027 and uh, we better be prepared. And, and if not, there's going to be a lot of explaining to do. Um, and so I think that dialogue has happened within uh, inside the government in certain areas inside the government that we need to prepare. And that's why in 2017, uh, that set a clock of 10 years. And why Lou Elizondo uh, earlier in this year said, you know, just find a hobby for five years. 
<laughs> and, uh, you know, it'll all be out in five years. And he said that this year. So that was 2027. Huh. And I would say I've heard 2027 in a kind of an official capacity that I can't reveal. So I think um, I, I would say that people in the government are aware of something happening and that there's limited time, uh, a few more years to prepare the people. And that's what's ramping up. Uh, this acceleration uh, from the previous seven decades of not even acknowledging it to now we we are acknowledging it at a faster and faster pace. Now I heard out on uh, I was probably social media like Twitter or something like that that uh, the the report that was supposed to be out October thirty first is going to be uh, publicly revealed before the end of the year. Now, I don't know how true that is and if it's just a rumor I'm passing along or not. Have you heard anything about that at all yourself? Uh, the report itself? No, yeah. I, I I don't know anything about the report. Um, it, they, the press was briefed uh, by the Pentagon recently uh, about the contents of a report or contents of findings that went into the report. Um, I do believe that the legislative branch was briefed as to some of the evidence in the report, uh, perhaps photographs or videos upon which the report was based. Uh, mm. So, but as far as the report itself, uh, I don't know what stage it's at yeah. um, because uh, the previous report was a preliminary assessment, it was not the report. And it seemed like that was written first and the actual report followed because it was very poorly written, in my opinion. It was just terribly written. And it doesn't seem like a product of the old DNI. It was so poorly written. Um, definitely a CIA officer did not write that. Uh, but I, I think that was like, let's get together the, the, what we have as uh, of what we collected and put together some statistics and put together this preliminary assessment and they're still working on the report. And that eventually got released. Um, but uh, that could be that there's no preliminary unclassified assessment this time around, that there is the classified report and from it, they might release unclassified parts of it to us. And I don't know when that's gonna happen, but keep in mind that this is an oversight function of the legislative branch on the executive branch. The executive branch owes a deliverable this report to the legislative branch, the people's representatives. It's up to the executive branch, not Congress, the executive branch to release that report to the public. Hmm. So there's a distinction there. Original classification authority rests with the ODNI and the, the Department of Defense. So Avril Haines and Secretary Austin, they're the original classification authority. They have original classification authority. And they're the ones who can, with that authority, then declassify certain parts of the report for release. And perhaps there's a debate going on between the Defense Department, which uh, if they had their way, they would not release anything, and the ODNI, which seems a little more forthcoming in what they want to talk about, what they can release. So it mm -hmm. could be an internal battle as to what can be classified and what can be unclassified. Um, but as far as when it happens, I don't know. Hmm. Hmm. Here's a, another a question here. In your opinion, why has the government been hiding this disclosure issue for so long? Well, it's not because uh, a spacecraft landed from another world and there may be beings on another world. That's an issue for science. Hmm. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's primarily it's the exploitation of what crashed. The fact that we were able to um, derive technology from these vehicles and adapt it for human use. That's one thing. The other thing is, did we get help in doing so from the occupants hmm. later? That if you believe in the Holloman Air Force Base story, landed, um, did we get help from them? And that can't be disclosed. I think the part that can't be disclosed is any existence of them on this planet. And 
their relationship to humans in the fact that perhaps that they had some uh, influence or uh, some intervention in how we developed because we basically, they don't look like us, we look like them. That's why some of them look like us, that they look human. They might be tall, and some people call them the tall Nordics, but some of them look like us. And perhaps because we are them. And mm. so that is that part of what was gained from our interaction, direct interaction with these various non-human intelligences, more than one. Uh, and that's that can't be disclosed. But the government now is more than happy to talk about lights in the sky all day long. And they're talking about uh, videos and photos and, you know, all of that and encounters by military aviators, encounters by uh, uh, naval personnel. They'll talk about that all the time. They mm. won't talk about who's in them. Yeah. How are they getting here? Yeah. Where are they from? They, they don't want to talk about that yet. Maybe that will be further along. Yeah, there's a lot of articles that have come out recently that say something like, oh, there's no sign of, you know, aliens or, or you, know, you know, like that. They're like just missing oh. and kind of close, close minded. Right, right, right. Looking at yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, that came out um, in the recent press, uh, uh, recent press event uh, sponsored yeah. by the Department of Defense. Uh, it, you have to parse. I tell people when the government speaks, they speak literally. You have to parse what they say literally. Don't add or subtract anything to what they say. And so when they said that we have no evidence of extraterrestrials, so forth and so on, they were referring to in the previous one year, we had reports from military personnel. In the reporting of these military personnel, we have no evidence that these are extraterrestrial craft and they're extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. Because... Most of the evidence are uh, was from uh, military aviators. They're inside their aircraft, and they encountered them. And so they didn't like actually like land, and they didn't land their plane, and they didn't go meet them. Hmm. You know, they didn't they didn't show themselves. They showed the craft. So that's why the report is about craft sightings. So the Department of Defense is not lying when they say that we have no evidence because the evidence they're pointing to is only restricted to that one year. Hmm. And the UAP task force, uh, you know, uh, they had no, they did not collect any data before November 12, 2004. That's Tic Tac, right? And so when they were asked about Maelstrom, Moultrie actually said that they were not in the holdings of the task force which is correct because they purposely limited their scope going back to 2004. Maelstrom happened in 67. Yeah. So I, I wish, by golly, if I was sitting on that committee as a member of Congress, I, I would ask better questions <laughs> uh -huh. because yeah. I would follow up and say, I, so, Mr. Mr. Moultrie, no, I wanted to know if does the Department of Defense have any evidence of what happened to Maelstrom back in 67? Not the mm -hmm. task force. The Department of Defense. And so wow. he answered honestly. They answer honestly, but they parse their answers literally very carefully. They never volunteer anything more than what you ask. Supposedly, they're mandated the beginning of next year to, to research all the way back to the 1940s, which would be really, uh, which would really open up a lot. A lot of stuff happened, of course. Um, right. Yes. Yeah. So that should be interesting. Uh, so this person wanted to know what is the connection between UAPs and things like the CIA's gateway project, the Pentagon Stargate project. Is there any connection that you're aware of? First of all, the gateway project was not CIA. That The gateway, uh, gateway is actually a, a term used by uh, the Monroe Institute itself. So it's the Monroe Institute's gateway program. Uh, CIA had various names for remote viewing. Uh, it was never Gateway. That's Monroe Institute. Stargate was one that was bantied around between CIA, uh, Department of Defense, and back to CIA. So when the program stopped, it was the CIA Stargate program. 
Uh, the army had something called Center Lane, and that was the name. But there were various names. As far as the connection between UAPs and remote viewing, uh, UAPs were remote viewed by remote viewers. Uh, there was a remote viewing of a uh, of a um, Galactic Federation done by the late Mel Riley, and that remote viewing session was facilitated by Ed Dames. Uh, so that's that's in the record. Um, Joe McMonagle remote viewed Mars many, many, like a million years ago and, and remote viewed it to be populated by these very tall beings that hmm. look human. Uh, so, you know, that's the connection uh, that remote viewers have reported being in contact with non-human intelligences. Now, as far as a more closer connection, um, some people have reported without evidence, and I have to stress without evidence, that some of these craft have no visible means of propulsion, and they look mm. like that the vis visible means of propulsion uh, is the occupant. Oh, wow. The occupants themselves, their uh -huh. consciousness becomes part of that craft. The craft becomes an extension of their consciousness, and they can then, probably using protocols similar to remote viewing, perhaps, uh, able to propel that craft where it needs to go. You literally think it someplace, and off it goes. The craft mm. itself is a holder of consciousness huh. with the occupants in it, and that's why well, we can't make some of these things fly. Now, mm. there's a story out in social media uh, I could never trace. I saw it once, and I lost it, that uh, Jumbalo Makizadek, uh, who has the Makaba uh, field uh, protocols, that he was asked, he was given like a blank check to make one of these craft fly using the uh, uh, Merkaba uh, protocols to make them fly. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. Hmm. And basically, that's a, a deep meditation protocol where you imagine like uh, yourself uh, swirling a, a vortex of energy around you. You can feel that energy going up and through your chakras along with some deep breathing exercise. Uh, and that's what he teaches. Uh, mm. And so that's a form, I guess, of of projection, astral projection or whatnot. But uh, I, I, I can't I can't find that reference anymore. Huh, how about that? If you were given a release from your NDAs from the new defense bill, would you testify if you were asked in Congress? Well, um, my NDAs have nothing to do with UAPs. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm free to testify about anything. Um, but, uh, you know, I, as any citizen, if, I, if I'm subpoenaed to testify, I will testify mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. anything. I'm, I'm free to do so. If they uh, would like me to testify, I'll be happy to do so. Um, I don't need a release of NDAs to do so because I don't have any UAP NDAs. Again, there, there are things I heard during my 25-year career um, that uh, led me to then investigate on my own. And that's when I discovered th certain things happening related uh -huh. to UAPs. But I, I was never read into. I, in fact, I was ref I refused to be read into any UAP NDA. I had an opportunity once to be read into the Orb Working Group, which I've talked about in other interviews. And I did not want to know anything about it because if I was read into it, I wouldn't be talking to you today or any of the previous interviews I've done. Hmm. Yeah. Another question here, is the government afraid that knowledge that they created us would undermine religious beliefs and cause chaos? Well, you know, the United States is a very secular country right now. And so there's a general belief by by majority of, I think, in various polls, majority of, uh, of Americans believe in a God. Let's I put, put it that way. Uh, but as far as like people attending church religiously, to use that phrase, mm -hmm. uh, every Sunday, uh, twice on Sunday and once on Wednesday or something, uh, if, if, uh, if, if that is the criteria, uh, 
we're, we're not a religious country anymore. I don't think we're so secular now that I don't think it will cause any kind of chaos to the people's belief systems. It will cause chaos to the markets, to the stock market. It will cause chaos in other ways. Uh, it will cause social chaos. Uh, but as far as religious chaos, I, I think we're very accepting of, of this. And, uh, and so I would say, no, I don't think the government's afraid of like any kind of religious upheaval. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think if you're an adher adherent of Eastern philosophies, that you'll be more amenable to understand what's going on because it's very part of their uh, belief system. If you're uh, uh, an indigenous uh, person, uh, either Native American or whatnot, it, you, it's part of your culture. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, I we have about, uh, I don't know, about 10 or 15 minutes to wrap wrap the show here. Uh, for I know you haven't eaten dinner yet. I really appreciate uh, you hanging in here. But um, I'd like for you to finish the show with something you talked about in the very first interview that we did together. And that's about when you went to the hotel where oh, there yeah. was a conference. Yeah. Can you, uh, some people have never heard that. It's a really interesting story. Yeah. I'd like for you to tell right. It. So um, I knew a gentleman who was with. Um, a science office and the director of science and technology is with the science office and he knew of my interest in this topic area uh, we did collaborate on other projects related to visualization scientific visualization so in the 90s we were playing with data gloves and uh goggles and three a 3d environment you know uh, portraying data in 3d through these goggles and being able to touch it tactile feel and we did that in the 90s and he so but he was he knew I was interested in in uh, that area and that's where we collaborated. He also knew I was interested in the UFO topic because I had my little alien doll, <laughs> which was uh, given to me uh, by one of my colleagues, which I will give him a shout out. Uh, and I can use his first name. His name is Mick. So hi, Mick. And yep. we were all part of this organization right here. You can't see it, but uh, this is the logo for the Collection Analysis Center. CIA Office of Technical Collection in the ST. That's where we're at. And so when I was in that office doing these projects, he invited me to um, to a symposium one day at a hotel. And he said, yep, just and I'll give you the address. It's, uh, I think it's 1960 uh, Chambridge Road in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. And I believe it was a Marriott. And he said, just show up. It's OK. It's on this date, whatever. And it's OK. So I showed up. And um, so uh, there was no security officer at this conference room on the mezzanine level of this hotel. There's no security officer whatsoever. I walked in, um, there were about three dozen people there. Uh, there was a sign in sheet. Uh, and so I signed in, printed my name, signed it, uh, put in um, my phone number and my government email address, my CIA. Mm -hmm government email address, put it there, I looked at the other folks and they all had .edu after their name. So they're from academia. Mm. No one I recognized immediately. I did recognize the gentleman who invited me from the off, uh, from the uh, science office. And I recognized another gentleman from my home office, my parent office, mm -hmm. uh, which at that time, I believe we were still the office of scientific and weapons research OSWR. Uh, one of the offices that had the UFO account going back decades. Okay. So, okay. I saw him and uh, I acknowledged his presence. And uh, so then they handed out the agenda. And the first thing up was CIA's involvement with UFOs going back to Roswell. And so the second part of the agenda was um, the CIA interest in alien dna hmm. and the third was a uh, about futures a look into the future where there will be an information technology explosion you know that we will be able to get information in our hands literally the all the world's information on the palm of your hand that hmm. didn't exist back then because in my pocket which i did not have to surrender because it was an unclassified um venue was my Motorola StarTac 
clamshell phone, right? Yeah. That's, that Flip was phone. Yeah. fate of the art back then. It was a very yep. expensive phone back then. And I had it. I didn't have to surrender it. I didn't have to show my badge. And I sat down. And so there goes the presentation talking about, you know, how CIA was uh, has studied uh, UFOs since 1947 mm -hmm. in the various offices um, and how in 52 they had to ramp up because of the sightings um, over Washington, D.C. And um, how, you know, we continue to study them in secret. Meanwhile, there was a program to completely disparage the entire topic, completely disparage the entire topic. You know, and, and that was the program, the public program. Yeah. You're, you, you're seeing things. It's not real. Meanwhile, yeah. we knew they were real and we're studying them. And then mm -hmm. he talked about um, in the mid 50s, 1955, the first U2 flight went up. There was silver. And he said, well, they were they were like they were uh, people thought them to be UFOs. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, uh, there were U2s because they were silver. So we tr we tr we know the trajectory in the air where we the flight path in the air and along that flight path within within sight of that u2 people start reporting ufos so we knew that but then 10 percent of these reports that we collected were not u2s they were not the a12 uh, which was the uh, predecessor for the sr-71 it, it was also silver it wasn't that it wasn't that they were real ufos so one out of ten were real ufos hmm. and that the mcminnville ufo uh, uh, seen by the Trents in 1950, I think it was March or May of 1950. I don't remember the exact month, but it, it was it was in Life magazine. That's a real UFO. It's never been debunked because that's one of the ones we studied. That it's a real UFO. Okay, mm -hmm. so and then so we we've been interested in alien DNA since after World War II, and it's not that I don't know if they extracted DNA and was able to study it because we didn't sequence the human genome until much later in the 90s right right but yeah. they were interested in something medically about whatever was recovered from roswell since at the end of world war ii this alien dna and later they found that you know they're like and i'm not a dna expert so i'm not going to use the wrong terminology uh, but like sequences in the in the genome uh, were in humans were similar into what they were later able to recover from either tissue samples or bodies that mm. perhaps are in cold storage somewhere that they were able to say, oh my gosh, you know, that's human, that's them. Mm. And there was an interest in that, and that at that point, CIA started to research DNA in earnest. And that particularly that there are familial lines with this enhancement of this DNA, that not only is it alien in all humans, but some humans have an enhancement of that DNA. And that's what piqued CIA's interest. Hmm. And that they studied this in the northeast corner of the United States. That's like New England. Yeah. And also overseas. They were collecting DNA samples. Huh. Uh, and I know that, you know, recently a former uh, director of central intelligence revealed that CIA did have a program to collect DNA overseas by using a vaccination program as a cover. There was a <laughs> real vaccination program, but mm -hmm. through this vaccination program, they were able to retrieve DNA huh. from this region of the world. Yeah. So uh, that was was what was discussed. And I got the agenda. I got the sign-in sheet. There was no classification markings. I kept the darn thing until the very day I retired. And I threw it in the burn bag on September 30th, 2009. Threw the sign-in sheet and the agenda into the burn bag, along with Eric Davis's application package. That When he wanted to join CIA, he sent us an application package. Huh. And so I threw that in it was with his... Uh, Basically, his CV, it listed hmm. all the work he did with the Air Force, hmm. uh, the Air Force Office of uh, Scientific Research. Science now, did, research you throw, did you throw that away purposely? Yeah, because I, I didn't want to. Well, first of all, um, I could have kept the agenda because it's unclassified. But I just don't want anything to do with CIA. 
When I said uh, on September 30, 2009, when I walked out, the happiest moment of my life was when I swore in as an officer of CIA. That's on June 16th, 1984. I swore in. And the next happiest moment, my professional life was when I walked out of that, that turnstile, turned around and gave the officer my badge. And I said, I don't need this anymore. I'm retired. And I had a big smile on my face. Yeah. And it's I said, walk like away and I don't want anything to do with CIA ever again. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like when you buy a boat. The, the best day is the day you buy it and the day you sell it. Yeah. That's what they always say. Yeah. How about that? Um, so what was the reaction of the uh, crowd that was there that day in that hotel when they were saying these different things? Well, it, there was no restriction on taking notes. Some of them were taking notes. Uh, pencils were flying. Pens were yeah. flying. Uh, I was just listening intently. Um, no one really asked a question, I think. I don't really even remember if there was an opportunity to ask a question. There might have been. Um, but no no one really followed up on anything that was said. It, it's like everyone there kind of were like, okay, yeah, I already know this. Like they were nodding their heads that they already knew this. Huh. Uh, it was like a familiarity. There were no gasps or anything like that um, yeah. at all. So I don't know who those academic people were, but they obviously had a relationship with CIA. Yeah. Because they were invited yeah. by a CIA office. And the briefer was from the history staff. Yeah. Who actually had access to those historical records, which, by the way, uh, the author of uh, Crypto's Conundrum, uh, uh, Chase Brandon said he, he accessed those records as well in the historical intelligence collection. So the history staff knows what's you know, knew what was in there. And so they briefed about what was there. Well, that is quite a fascinating story. Quite a fascinating story. Well, I want to thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I know you. it's time for you to go. And I really appreciate your time. And, uh, and also, uh, I'm so glad that you were able to come back after whatever was going on the last time you were here and we couldn't really communicate that well. But thank you so much, John. It's a real pleasure and happy holidays to you. Happy holidays to you. Thank you very much, Martin. All right. Take care. And happy holidays to everyone out there. And we'll be back next week with Kurt Jamungle. Now that will be a pre-recorded show, but I'll be here in chat. And uh, I just, he just can't uh, be recording. Uh, he can't be live, unfortunately. So thanks again, everyone. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky.